Fall Out Equestria, E-201, by Stryker1959, read by Forrest M., featuring Stryker1959, voice of Porter. Entry 3, Fallout. Twenty days post last day, Porter. And you're saying you've picked up what now? I asked one of the scientists. Distress beacons, the old stallion replied. We already have a number of locations from them. This could be an important development. Where is Steadfast? I asked. Standing right here. I turned around to face the confused-looking captain. Is something wrong? I could only nod. You need to see this. Patrol Picket. E-201, Captain Steadfast Commanding, Equestrian Royal Navy, Captain's Log, Three Weeks After Apocalypse. We're now standing at three weeks since the end of the world as we knew it. Some of my crew have started calling the day the bombs fell the last day. While I don't know if that title will stick, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if it did. We've been outside of Chikakult for a week, and we've finally seen something other than grey. Coming on shift this morning, I walked onto the bridge to see snow settling on the forward windscreens. I would have gone outside, but my first officer stopped me to show me the external radiation readings. The ambient radiation level had nearly doubled, and while still low, being outside without the proper equipment would be suicidal in the long term. Lucky for us, the staff in the bunker had left us some environmental suits so we could go between the ships and the facility proper. A trip inside revealed some more concerning news. For a brief period of time, Porter's crew had established a connection to the general command frequency. During that short stretch, they managed to record four distinct distress beacons, all with locations attached but when attempting to send out a transmission in hopes whoever had activated the beacons was still listening, the channel simply died. The best we can tell is that there may be something wrong with the facility's communication array, but there's no way to be sure without taking the whole array apart. Without available replacement components, it was decided to leave the issue be for now. But with locations came an important question as to whether there are more survivors out in the countryside. To say, there was a serious debate among my command staff, and Porter may not do the arguments to and against scouting out of the gathered coordinates the proper justice. After the better part of two days, we finally decided to go and investigate one set of coordinates. Twenty days post last day. Steadfast. We're not picking up much for radiation out there, Captain. Now, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. I replied into the radio. I'm going with the boarding party, Spark. All right. You know where to find us if you need us, sir. The sergeant in charge of E-201's Marine Response Unit, Sandstorm, tapped my shoulder. Something wrong, sir? He asked. I just shook my head. Not at all, Sergeant. I reached over and pulled the release for the boarding ramp. As it hit the ground, it revealed a sparse mountaintop outside the entrance to the cave. Now then, let's see what called us out here. I clutched my rifle, even though its sling hung around my shoulders. The plateau outside the cave was quiet if the sounds of the wind rushing past my ears was discounted. There wasn't even any signs of alpine vegetation that I'd associate with a mountain peak. Hiking across the plateau, we finally entered the cave proper. As we kept going deeper, I noticed a low noise of some sort. Does anybody else hear that? I asked. As we entered the main chamber, I found my own question answered. With my gaze fixed on the slumbering purple giant, I swallowed my pride and shrugged. Never mind, I just answered my own question. Entry continues. The location in question was the summit of a mountain at the opposite end of the same range that Canterlot anchored. With worsening weather, it took the better part of a day to actually reach the mountain. 
Capped by a cave entrance, I still don't know what we actually found. Other than the massive sleeping dragon, thousands of books, and a massive computer system that we found to be a Crusader mainframe. I've only seen briefings on the specifications of these things, but I didn't even think they'd have ever been built. Yet, here one is, with the tag serial number only holding a single digit. Two. If there was another one of these out there, it would be a major boon. But that's simply my ramblings getting the best of myself. After we noticed six rather ordinate pieces of jewelry displayed on pillars around the chamber, we realized what we had stumbled upon. The necklaces were clearly the elements of harmony. They hadn't been seen for years, yet here they were. Further examination of the chamber showed that the pillars weren't for show. They were some sort of energy collectors, and the elements were obviously supposed to be a power source. In their current state, I could only wonder if they had been used as some sort of retaliation against the zebras. We left everything in that cave exactly as we found it, and made our way back to the cold storage facility. I... I just don't want to know what that device really was. With all that's happened, I think I can live without an answer. 